everyone. Welcome to Beyond Code, the importance of elevating non-code contributions. My name is Fatima. I'm Abu Bakr, uh, and we are from GitLab. We're on the developer evangelism team. Uh, on the we're on the developer evangelism team that sits under the developer relations team, where we work on DevSec, AI, ops, and building community. So today we wanted to talk a little bit about non-code contributions, what examples of those might look like. We'll share a little bit background on our experiences working in open source communities and at GitLab. And then at the end, we want to have this open forum discussion. So if you have reflections as we're talking or if you have questions, like please write them down and then we'll have 15 minutes or more at the end. We want this to be like a very open format. We want to learn from you as much as we tell you what we've experienced. Yeah. Okay, we'll start with me, my story in the community. All my career has involved community, right from all the way back to 2004, 2005, when I was still in the higher institution at Federal Polytechnic Bochi. Here are some pictures of some of the sessions that I had then. The main goal of the community then was to, I wanted to have an environment whereby I can learn from my friends, hang out with my friends definitely, and also share knowledge. And it evolved from just being a group of friends, learning with what one another, to members of the institution joining, coming together, and also members from the city, even sometimes members from out of town, joining to come and be a part of the community. And the main goal is to learn, share, and grow with one another. Even when we started partnering with organizations like the Google Developer Groups, DigitalOcean, and a couple of organizations like they do today, and they, are, they defined their KPIs and other things for engagement, the goal still remains the same, to learn, share, and grow as a community. Fatima? Mm -hmm. So my background in open source uh, came because of a job. I had gotten a job that they wanted me to learn Drupal, and they said, you need to go to this conference, you need to figure out what this project is, uh, get involved, figure it out. So I went to DrupalCon, and in that community they say, come for the code, stay for the community, and it really rings true because you, get, you go there in order to better understand the project or contribute a component or module, but you end up meeting all of these contributors from all over the world and feel really connected and like part of something bigger. And so over the years I got involved with community contribution, I became a core contribution mentor. Uh, the first photo there is like the mentoring group in DrupalCon Vienna, which was really Really cool. It was my first time like uh, walking somebody through the process, like a new contributor, walking them through the process of contributing something. And when you see like someone's face light up because they've made a contribution, like it's very rewarding for yourself as a mentor as well. Um, so like GitLab, Drupal is also a very complex project, so it's not always easy for people to just, you know, show up and contribute. You know, you need to have a lot of background, you might need to have specific technical skills, you might need to know a specific language, um, and so there are other types of contributions that are also very valuable, like writing documentation or testing or writing an onboarding guide or helping somebody translate something for another community. And so those are the kinds of things that we want to share. We're going to talk a few about a few of the different non-code contributions that we've worked with, and then some examples of programs or initiatives that you can do to support those types of contributions. I'm gonna start with events. Yeah, we are here, Open Source Summit, an event. Mm -hmm. So events are a huge part of non-code contribution. It brings the community together to come and learn from one another, share experiences, share learnings, and even uh, create more opportunities for the future. Well, all this event involves a lot. From, for example, this event took months of planning, months of logistics, working with partners, ensuring security. You are going to be dealing with humans, and humans are complex. Ensuring safety and coordination, inclusion of everyone, is a huge task that every community member has to do with. Not to talk of venue management, working, and this is at a large scale. Now, if you come down to meetups, yeah, some of these organizations already have partners they work with, or they can tap Google, Google will give money and so on. But you in your local community, you have to go convince some uh, sponsor or some organization and show them this is the value of this event. This is why you should support this event and so on. And this event at the end of the day brings opportunities for the community to grow. That is where new contributors are initiated. That is where new members have ideas on how to contribute or how to influence 
other part of the community. And even non-code contributions, that is where people have ideas on how, oh, this is how we can grow the community. This is how we can make it inclusive. And this is how, as a community, through events, we can grow better. Fatima? So with open source projects, there's a number of different things that go into that. We've listed out a couple here, like documentation, planning your roadmaps, your, your community, your customers, your users, they all want to know what you're building next. So if you're organizing an open source project, likely you are also planning a roadmap, planning future features and releases. You also want to onboard new contributors, you want to mentor them, have training, so that you can continue to retain them as they have experience contributions to your project. Then there's the like hands-on programming part of it, like triage and feature discussions. And what we find even with contributors to GitLab is, you know, there's one person who writes the patch, uh, but there are so many people that go into the process of getting that patch committed to the product. You know, there's people who provide suggestions, there's somebody who jumps in and says, hey, I tested this, but it's not working, here's the screenshots, here's why it's not working. And so all of those people don't tend to get contribution. It's usually the person who committed the line of code that fixes the thing or adds a new feature. And so I think it's important to take a look at that whole process from onboarding that new contributor to mentoring them to them you know, filling out an issue or reporting a bug or helping somebody review an issue that they've created for. And so there's like a number of valuable contributions along that kind of life cycle of a contributor that I feel that we don't recognize yet and that I would like us to start recognizing in the scope of open source projects. Yeah, next thing is community management. Yeah, how do you keep all this community together? Okay, you organize events, they attend. Some people come to learn, some people come for swags. I, for one, that's part <laughs> of one of the reasons why I come to events. Then others contribute, but at the end of the day, how do you keep everything together? How do you bring in new contributors, maintain them, enable them to grow through the community so that you don't keep dealing with... One of the issues I had while I was managing events back home in Nigeria is every day people, you are dealing with newcomers, new people. You have to maintain new content. How do you get those newcomers through the stages to become contributors, to become future speakers to become non-code contributors in the future. So creating those pipelines, defining a goal as a community. What, why are you having the community? What's your end goal at the end of the day? And what are the KPIs? Are you just worried about numbers? Are you worried about monetary aspect? Are you influenced by an organization that has objectives to find? All those have to be in place. The member retention. How do you want to keep your members? So you don't have a system whereby people just come one day, second day, they don't feel like coming. Or they feel this is too basic for my experience. Or the community has played to it, there is no much growth that members of the community can achieve. Then content management. As a community, we generate a ton of content. How do you coordinate the articles, the videos? This session is currently being recorded. How does it become valuable for members of the community? How do they find it? How do they benefit from it? And also code of conduct. We are complex human beings and from multi cultures. What is right? Uh, they call it moral relativism. Mm -hmm. What is right in one side might be wrong in another side. What is offensive is on one side. And they are generally general of things that are offensive. But then culture differ. And how do we ensure that as a community, we all become inclusive, we all coordinate with and work with one another in a, in a safe and secure environment? Yeah. So now that we've covered some types of non-code contributions, uh, we have some ideas of how to recognize them and then we're really looking to hear some of your ideas on how to recognize them. So one of the ways to uh, celebrate your community members is giving them achievements. So you could do this through badges. We're implementing a badging system on GitLab. So you know when somebody reviews an MR or closes an MR or gives a hackathon contribution, we give them a little gamification icon on their profile that they can feel excited about. But there's a lot of platforms that allow you to do that as well. There's like Credly where you can set up badges and share them with community members. If you're already on certain community platforms like Discourse or Reddit or Stack Overflow, they tend to have their own systems for gamification and awarding contributors or recognizing them. 
Uh, a lot of companies like ourselves, we have a GitLab Heroes program. Advocates is a great place to give recognition and see what they're working on. Some of our heroes are very technical. They'll write blog posts for us with code snippets and all of that. Some of our heroes are not so technical, but they can provide you know, feedback on initiatives. They can test new features that are in experimental stages. They can come to events and talk about their experiences and inspire other people. And so really figuring out who your advocates are and how you can reward the different types of work that they are good at. Uh, and finally, like people like a worker who loves swag, you can always <laughs> give swag in exchange for participation. But I think something more powerful than sending somebody a mug or a backpack or a pen, like these things are great, is actually giving them opportunities. So maybe you have a learning internship at your company. Maybe uh, your project does a shadow program. Uh, we have those at GitLab as well, where we have shadow programs. You can shadow the CEO. We have a development director program where external contributors can actually shadow one of our development directors and see what the day-to-day -day of working at GitLab is. And so I think some of those opportunities are actually very valuable. So if someone is contributing to your project, uh, this might be a way to give them value back. And so it's, it's a good relationship. And then finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as contributors, we all hear it online. A very good and hardworking uh, contributor suddenly says he's taking a break or for some reason, He's, taking, he's going out of the community. Not because of anything, but because we are all humans and life happens. Sometimes it's mental health, sometimes it's just burnout. People have been working years and years and we all went through the pandemic. Everyone had their experiences from the pandemic. And one thing as a community is how do we ensure members of our community are healthy, to stay safe. And an environment is created for them to feel safe and also be able to share and learn from their experiences, not just the code part, but how some of us are parents, some of us are passing through some challenges in life, some of us are caregivers, some of us are in environments that have complex situations, political situations. So being able to create an environment where we share, we learn, we feel comfortable, and where possible we feel vulnerable to be able to speak. Because sometimes it's not about fixing it, it's just about being able to let out, share with someone, and learn from someone. And as a multicultural community, a lot of our communities are, almost all of our communities are multicultural. Learning from a different culture, a different environment, creates a system whereby we'll be able to become more inclusive, be able to become more welcoming to others. Because you only be able to understand and welcome someone, let's say from South Asia or Africa, or understand their situation if you know what they are going through, if they've been able to be vulnerable with you and be able to share. You even know where to support better when they are comfortable sharing with you or sharing their experiences of how they're, whatever they go through. So creating a healthy, safe environment where we can be vulnerable as a community is very crucial in how we maintain communities. That's why communities need to have groups or committees that ensure safety, mental, mental health, and a more conducive environment for contributors within the community. So we've covered the importance of non-code conversations, some examples that we've seen from event planning to uh, parts of the open source project cycle to uh, community management, as well as having non-code conversations as well as contributions. So we wanted to have an open forum discussion with all of you today. Uh, we've prepared a Slido with two very general questions uh, so that you could submit questions if you feel uncomfortable speaking on the mic or on the recording. So you can submit questions to the Slido using this URL slido.com and then the hashtag number, which is 1979645. Um, and then we'd also love for this to be interactive. So you can submit questions there, but you can also submit reflections, things you're thinking about. And if you feel comfortable, uh, we have a audience mic as well, so you can come up and share a reflection or question with us. Share something that maybe your company is doing to recognize non-code contributions. Uh, that would be great. Abu Bakr is going to get the mic. Thank you. Two participants are typing. So Abu Bakr, what's a non-code contribution that you've made recently? I spoke yesterday. <laughs> I spoke about uh, understanding the SEC in uh, DevSecOps. It, security is still a major part of uh, a, a major issue in our industry. So I spoke about people who are not familiar with security, 
how do they apply, what are the different attack vectors, how do they mitigate them, and how do they automate their software development life cycle to be able to do that. Oh, we have a couple. Oh, podcasts. Podcasts. Uh -huh. Almost everyone are hosting podcasts these days. Yeah, <laughs> no, they're great. I yeah. Because you can listen to a podcast while you're walking somewhere, and it's a great way to feel connected to somebody that you may not get to see in person. Yeah, and we are getting to learn more about people from different parts of the world just by listening to them on podcasts. Yeah, develop training. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, at least so that others can be able to learn more. Uh, yeah, it's always great when, so if we have a community member who has put together a training, um, they'll share it with us or they'll share it on their social media. And then, <laughs> and then uh, I put together our community newsletter. So I don't actually write most of the content, you know, like I just start collecting all of the content. So if I see someone's done a podcast, I will just grab that and put that in the newsletter. So that's my non-code <laughs> contribution. There's no code involved. It's a drag and drop newsletter editing process. Attending this session, that's a great one. <laughs> yeah, it is, because at least you've come here, you've learned something, you'll be able to, even if it is you attend another meeting somewhere and you share some of the things you've learned somewhere, you've contributed to a project, you've contributed to open source. Does anyone want to like, talk in more detail about something that they submitted? OK. <laughs> this is your job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least I get to exercise. Oh. <laughs> we had to climb so many stairs to come up to this room. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. And uh, I'm Petya from Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, and that's a big passion of mine on non-con contributions. I'm not a software developer myself, but I focus on tech engagement. And yeah, a few examples. I think we, uh, we had an outreach in Menti, for instance, and our project was exactly about technical documentation. And I'm really big advocate, I always say, like other examples that we do is I run a working group where people can join. Maybe one thing I don't see here is also testing, so involving a lot of our users in testing the software before we deploy, like on staging. And there's been really interesting feedback because normally people say, I'm not technical, but actually <laughs> they're contributions. So yeah, just wanted to say thank you for having this session because I think it's really important and great to hear all the examples. Thank you. Yeah, user testing is a really important one. Like, I worked at the city of Boston, and you don't know if people are able to load the website or use it or if it's accessible until you put it through that test. So, thank you. <laughs> hey, um, so I lead communities at the Green Software Foundation, and um, we are um, about half of our work is technical, and the other half is really building policies, building communities. So, I, I think I put Meetup Group on here podcasts, but um, a lot of our work isn't just building the tools for people to have greener software, it's also helping helping them learn about it, helping discover in the first place, spreading that awareness and building standards. So actually, while code is a big thing, it's, it's probably only 50% of what we do. Wow, that's really great. Yeah, it's awesome. I think the Linux Foundation like houses almost everything around Linux, uh, cloud native and everything, and the platform, for example, I am aware of the LFX platform, yeah, so almost an in the infamous or famous CNCM landscape <laughs> with all the logos of projects and everything. So it's very good that you have a platform. It's part of enablement, be able to enable the project to grow because after, at the end of the day when project people have contributed, suddenly you see a project dying or you go to uh, the project repo and it's only been updated nine years ago. Like, <laughs> so it's a very great work that foundations like the Linux Foundation are, are doing to keep our projects healthy. Thank you. <laughs> I think one story I yesterday was uh, one of the speakers that attended this session. He was able to attend the Open Source Summit because he attended an event okay. back home in Nigeria, uh, Open Source Community Africa. And Chris Anitzik, the I think CTO of CNCF, was there and he gave a voucher uh, that, oh, if you want to go to the Open Source Summit, you can come. And he's, he, he was here yesterday speaking about uh, observability. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the, the, the success stories you hear from this event, this community. You don't know where opportunities can take people and how they can benefit the community further. Okay, awesome. Open tofu. Open tofu, I just read it this morning. <laughs> open TF became open tofu, right? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I was reading about it this morning. <laughs> awesome. She our accepting our open tofu. Nice. <laughs> okay. Next question? Yeah, next question. Okay, so um, this may or may not be a controversial question, um, but when you're talking about non-code contributions, and, and a lot of projects, they measure contributions, so they might give you points for specific things that you do. Like, if you're a contributor on Stack Overflow, for example, like answering a question is a certain number of points, uh, upvoting a question is a different number of points. If you get, like, the solution, you might get plus 30 points. And so there are different ways to recognize and weigh non-code contributions, and this is something we're still figuring out as well. Um, so I thought that this would be a good like open discussion. Like if you have non-code contributions in your organization, how do you recognize them? How do you weigh them? Are you rewarding them? Are you sharing them? Yep. We would love to hear from you. <laughs> or you can take the mic if we'd if love you. if you would take <laughs> the mic. Badging. Awesome. Yeah, badging. Yeah, that's a nice one. Director of Champions and Experts. Yeah, I, I am a part of the Google Developer Experts, and I think there's this thing JetBrains gives. Uh, they can give you one year license to uh, their software if you are listed in the directory of the GDEs publicly available online. So I think that that's why directory is important. And it's also recognition for you to be able to say, OK, to recruiters or employers that I am this, and it's recognizable. It's not just by your word. Yeah, and that brings you to other opportunities as well. Like yeah. If we invite our heroes to speak at an event, yeah. uh, it's very good for them as well as for us. It makes us look good, but yeah. it also makes the hero have the opportunity to network at the event to share yeah. their expertise. Um, and then demonstrate the impact of the contribution. I love that because sometimes, like you were saying, like people will say, I'm not technical, but they'll write like a really great explanation or documentation for something that someone who may be technical but may have never you know, touched this part of the code or yeah. learned about this function yeah. will be able to read that and understand. And so sometimes I think we make contributions and they kind of go into this void and you never get to see the impact that yeah. your contributions are having. Yeah, swag, yeah. <laughs> Definitely swag. <laughs> tired of swag. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a, a, a funny story. When I was hosting the, the Digital Ocean community back home in Andrea Abauchi, so the first time they wanted to send us swags, so we were just expecting probably a few hoodies or socks, but they ended up sending like 10 cartons of different swags, <laughs> T-shirts, different sizes. So we, at a point, we didn't know what to do, so we organized a very huge event, students and so on. To the extent, anywhere in the whole town, if I see a digital ocean t-shirt, <laughs> I know it's from that event. <laughs> That's amazing, like you're all connected by this yeah, giant exactly. box of <laughs> Yeah, I, I love the idea of sharing champion stories and, and contributor contributions. I think one like mechanism by which we can do that is through our newsletter, but you know, the newsletter is also limited because the community that's reading it is also the community that we're sharing back to. And so I personally would love to hear like other examples of ways that we can share that impact to, you know, I, the people I want to reach are not the people who are already reading the newsletter. Like, I want to reach the people who think that they don't belong uh, in that, you know, highlight, contributor highlight section in the newsletter. Like, the people who are nervous about it or like, oh, I don't have anything to contribute. Like, where can I meet those people and how can I encourage them and know that their contributions are valued? I don't know. That's why this is a bop. Yeah. Maybe you can put put it on social media, so like uh, just like one person a week or someone who has contributed a lot recently, you can even do it monthly, it depends on how many contributors you have. So maybe something like that, or you can specifically highlight that part of the newsletter yeah. in a social media post, which will also be good for the newsletter, but also recognize who is contributing, so maybe something like that. Yeah. Have you done that before? Uh, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we did consider it. I was a community manager at another organization. So uh, yes, we have, so whenever someone got any kind of a title, so even if it's like becoming a community manager yeah. or recently becoming, um, what was the name? Like a contributor, but like someone who has contributed frequently, so someone like a member maybe. So yeah, we, we used to do that. So. Um, yeah, like tagging them, giving them that recognition because 
at the end of the day the organization will have a lot of followers yeah. uh, you know so that usually matters and it makes them feel good yeah. <laughs> so yeah something. awesome thank you thank you yeah i was also reading this uh demonstrates the impact of contribution i do share and use a i think that is a very great point because if people are able to see that oh this company or this organization actually took our feedback and change was made or an impact was achieved. It, it will spur more people to share feedback and be able to, uh, I think that's a very great point. Anyone else? Yeah, I think a question I've always wanted to have, does anyone do live streaming here? Oh, okay. I, <laughs> I've always wanted to know how, um, I'm always fascinated about doing live streams, but I end up not doing it. <laughs> so it's to see how it actually impacts uh, not just code contributors, but non-code to be able to contribute back to the community. Because most of the videos or live streams you see online are just someone live coding or creating some examples somewhere. Yeah, I think we had a we have a friend in the community, PJ Mads, yeah, uh, yeah. who used to live stream quite a bit, and so this is something that he relayed to me is that uh, it really lowers the barrier uh, to feeling technical because you know you're live streaming while you know he did a lot of Python bots, so yeah. he would be <laughs> you know I'm trying to figure out how to do this, but I I don't even know how to start this function, and you know p part of this live stream is him just googling it and figuring it out and going, and and we're sitting in the chat, and we're like, no, PJ, that's not the right function. <laughs> you know? And you would see like people in the chat being like, well, thanks for doing this because now I don't feel like yeah. I'm really lost. And so it gives people, you know, a moment to feel like relatability where yeah. it's like, oh, you're struggling too. Like I struggle the same way or I always forget where yeah. the documentation is as well. And so from what I've heard, I think live streaming helps lower that barrier. Yeah. Uh, but it, I think it also depends on what the project is and, and who's watching, if anyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's very true. So also, mentoring. How do you think mentoring? Because I see mentoring as one of the things that actually spurs mm -hmm. uh, a lot of community. Because a lot of people feel uncomfortable, don't know where to start. And mentoring seems to be one way to be able to boost more of non good contribution. How have you seen the impact of mentoring? Um, I. In my experience, I have mentored more contributions than I have done contributions. So, like, if you track my open source contributions, it's always like a comment where Sugar Overflow helped me do it. <laughs> so, I get no credit for that, you know? Like, the credit goes to the person who wrote the patch, or they reviewed a translation, or they uploaded, like, some testing information. But I'm sitting there, like, hmm. If I were you, I would, you know? <laughs> and so it was a really good experience for me because I used to feel not technical enough. And my way of like overcompensating for that was I'll just mentor and then that person can do the hard stuff and I will help guide them. But I, I learned that like it's very hard to be the mentor because you kind of have to like sit on your hands and you yeah. want the person to learn the process yeah. so that when you're not there, they can do it as well. So it was a very good learning opportunity for me to like listen and like observe and, and like not say anything until they're <laughs> ready to receive like the next step or a hint or something. So yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely learned a lot. Yeah, awesome. I think it's also, based on the explanation you give, it's also valuable to uh, ma managing a community because definitely some older folks from the community will leave. Okay, life will happen. People will move on to some other things. So being able to, when mentees will then grow to be the new managers of the community that will grow to the community. In the early days of Kubernetes, we all know, oh, Kelsey Hightower, Brian Lyle, Drew Beda, and so on. But now you hardly even hear about them in the community, though they are still a part of pass when new people are now maintaining the community and growing the community as, as we go. And it's important to have experts in different areas. Like yeah. If I'm good at back-end engineering, I'm probably not going to be good at design, <laughs> right? And so you need to have people in your community that can be uh, able to share their area of expertise and make space for sharing that. Yeah, so. awesome. Anyone wants to share anything? Yeah. Or we can stop the session and have a casual conversation without the recording. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe first uh, an answer that's somehow not really there in my opinion, but it's really easy. Just the next time you see the guy on the hallway in the canteens, I'm coming from corporate, just tell him in person, thank you so much. And yeah, it's really an in-person thank you is 
so much worth. You see the smile on the face, he sees your smile on the face. Yeah. That's really nice. Yeah, yeah. I definitely agree because I've, uh, I think there was a time I met someone somewhere and he was kind of sharing how he got into tech by attending one of my sessions. And I was in, at a very low state at that particular period in time. And, but the person sharing our experience with, with, uh, about something I did that I didn't even know impacted anyone. And he was now sharing the, how that spawned him into tech and how he's able to achieve this, get his job in this place and so on. It really boosted me and gave me that morale to, okay, I think this is working and doing more will definitely benefit more members of the community. Mm -hmm. um, second thing, um, I have a general question about uh, non-code contributions. Mm -hmm. Maybe you got a good answer. <laughs> so if you go to a project, it's always, you go to repo, you have code there, you see issues. About non-code non contributions is a little harder because the work is usually going on in somewhere in the background, mm -hmm. deep inside, I don't know, some forum maybe. <laughs> So what's a good way to list or show open tasks where people can get into? Is there some pattern? Just do you create issues like it, it was code or? The way that I've seen this done uh, in two different communities is, for example, event planning as an example. Uh, create an issue for the event, add tasks for the planning. Even if the planning is happening majorly, sometimes it's in meetings on Slack or it's a Zoom call, like just post a little summary of these people were in attendance, this is what we did. And usually at the end of the event, you can say like all of these volunteers were involved in the contribution of this event. So before you close that issue, like just give them all credit in order to like, even if the, all of the work is not there, like just recognize the work. So I kind of put the responsibility to do, the, to do that, like with an event with the organizer, like list out all of your volunteers and give them contribution in a public space and not just like yeah. at the event on a slide or in a meeting that they're in, but in the space that everyone looks at. Um, maybe with projects we can use specific tags. Like I know a lot of open source projects have like an open for contributions tag, but yeah. maybe there's also like a documentation tag or a testing tag um, or a needs, you know, user yeah. experience testing tag. Um, and that's a way of highlighting like if you filter by these two tags, you'll find opportunities for you to contribute that may not necessarily be review this issue, write me some code. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one other thing to that is. Um, probably if you want to get people who are not familiar with the project is to use times they are familiar with. Oh, instead of, oh, we have uh, an RFP or we have a CFP or something, it might probably be, oh, we need designers. We need this so that, oh, I know how to do design. Do I don't know anything about Kubernetes. I can help. Oh, we need technical writers. We need this to contribute so that people will be able to see things they can do and also detailing in the readme's or the project oh this is how you can come in this is how you can onboard this is how you can contribute and also uh, create a system where there are certain people we have a couple of anonymous here there are certain people who just want to do they don't want their names to be out there so creating an environment for them where they can actually perform some work or do some things or just give without necessarily creating paper trails, but maybe due to policies in their work or due to some personal reasons. Also creating that environment where someone can just, oh, I'm passing by, I saw this. Yeah, fix, move on. They don't necessarily want to be part of community or part of anything, but they just want to do a move on. So creating that environment where information is public, information is transparency, and also showing, oh, this is this thing that was done. For example, like uh, I, I think the Kubernetes project, mm -hmm. they list all the contributors that contributed to the project at the end of the day and what parts they played in it, So, it's, which is part of appreciation also. So being able to show and document how people can help, where they can help, the specific things they can do, and the resources they can use, it's very valuable in ensuring that you have more uh, non-code contributors to participate. 
one of the things we saw success with last yeah. year was doing a documentation themed hackathon. Yeah. Like we're only going to work on the docs issues. And I think that was a, it was a good positioning for us to be like, you normally don't come to our hackathons because you feel like you don't have, you don't know Ruby yeah. or Rails. You can't communicate, you can't contribute to the code base. This is a docs hackathon. <laughs> like, you know, all you have to do is read the docs and, <laughs> and edit some docs, update some docs that are out of date. And so that was a one way that I think we saw some success. I think it yeah. still needs, there, there, there's more steps ahead of that. I think yeah. we can improve on that. But uh, when you asked the question, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> we have like only five minutes. So, five minutes. Yeah. Um, Any other question? <laughs> they, have, they need the time to walk. <laughs> <laughs> going once, going twice. <laughs> well, if you so. want to talk one on one, we'll be at the GitLab booth for the rest of the conference. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome.